I'd like to welcome everyone today to our uh, webinar on resilient transportation and climate adaptation. Um, my name is Raymond Garino. I'm a principal transportation planner uh, for the Old Colony Planning Council. Um, we will be discussing the impact of climate change on transportation <laughs> and how we can plan for adapting to those impacts and how we can reduce uh, greenhouse gases from transportation sources. First, I want to introduce our Old Colony Planning Council Executive Director, Mary Waldron. Thank you, Ray, and um, good afternoon, everyone. I believe uh, this day has gone so quickly by, but um, first and foremost, um, I wanna say thank you to the Executive Office and our partner regional planning agencies. Um, collaboration in these times are really important. Um, not just only on this topic, but all um, all of our planning efforts. And um, I'm I'm you know I really am proud to be executive director of this organization, but I'm also proud to be part of the Mass um, Association of Regional Planning Agencies. Uh, we have great collaboration on many things. And you know today I know that we'll be talking about you know climate change change as it relates to transportation infrastructure. But um, I'm speaking to the choir here today that you know climate change affects all of our lives, all aspects of our lives, the quality of our life as well as transportation. And, um, and you'll be hearing more from the panelists. Um, I just wanna be able to, I've asked all the Old Colony Planning Council um, staff to put OCPC by their name and um, which they have. And I'm um, so many of the, the team here today um, work together, closely work together um, to make this happen. So I want to say thank you to all of them for being on today. So um, there's an exciting program um, ahead, and I'm going to turn this back over to Ray to continue on with the program. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Mary. Um, I am uh, pleased uh, to introduce our panelists today. Um, we have Hong Han Shu. Uh, she is the Global Warming Solution Act Program Manager at the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. Welcome, Han, and thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, we have uh, Stephen Tupper, who's the Transportation Program Manager at the Cape Cod Commission. Welcome, Stephen. We also have slated for today, Martin Pillsbury. He's the Director of Environmental Planning at Metropolitan Area Planning Council. Um, I'm not sure if Martin is here yet, if you are. Say hello. Oh, maybe he'll be a little bit on a little bit later. Um, we also have slated Bill Napolitano. Uh, he's a rivers, trails, and watersheds coordinator from South, Southeastern Regional Planning and Economic Development District. Uh, I know that Bill said he will be on, on a little bit later. So he probably hasn't been here yet. So um, Han, Han is going to uh, lead us off first. But before she does, uh, I just want to uh, make a, some quick housekeeping announcements. Uh, our question and answers are going uh, to go through the question and answer button on, on your screen. Uh, Sean Bailey will be, um, Sean Bailey will be fielding uh, these question and answers. We're also recording this webinar and it's gonna, gonna be available at the Old Colony Planning Council YouTube channel. Um, and we'll be entertaining questions after each presentation. We're going to have a five minute period. Um, and then at the end of all the presentations, we'll have a little bit longer uh, sort of an overall period for, um, for questions and answers. So um, if Han is ready, we're, we're going to queue up Han's um, presentation. And um, she's first. Um, Han Shu, um, she manages and authors the Commonwealth's Clean Energy and Climate Plan uh, it also updates the Global Warming Solution Act progress. Um, the full, full uh, bio, bio of all of our panelists will be uh, put in, in, the chat, in the chat room. So I'm going to turn the floor over to Han. Thank you, Ray. Um, thank you, Ray, so much and for others um, at OPC, um, OCPC for having me today here, talking with you all about greenhouse gas emissions reduction strategies for the transportation sector. Um, while Massachusetts only make up about 2% of the US population and about 1% of the US emissions, we do need to do our part in reducing global warming 
um, limiting global warming and adapting to climate change. And with the transportation sector producing more than 40% of statewide emissions in the Commonwealth, it's important to focus on strategies and actions that can further reduce emissions here in this sector. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, so for uh, my presentation today, I will spend um, some time going over the major sources of greenhouse gas emissions in Massachusetts and the key findings in the 2050 decarbonization roadmap uh, study. And then I will discuss strategies outlined in our interim clean energy and climate plan for 2030 um, for reducing um, emissions across all sectors, but I will focus today's presentation on just the strategies um, in that interim plan on the transportation sector emissions. If you can go to the next slide. In this graph here, um, you can see that our statewide greenhouse gas emissions level in 1990 was 94.3 million metric tons, and it went down 22% to 73.5 million metric tons in 2018, um, which is the latest year of available data. Um, we have had great progress reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the electric sector. That's the uh, yellow part of the bar charts, um, reducing more than 50% in that sector since 1990. Um, we have um, decent progress reducing emissions in the building sector. Um, especially through energy efficiency measures in the last 10, uh, 15, 20 years. And then um, also decent progress reducing emissions in the non-energy sectors um, and industrial processes in non-energy sectors. And that's the orange um, part of the bar chart. If you look at the green part of the bar chart, um, that's the transportation sector emissions. And uh, you can see that it's the only major sector in our um, Commonwealth that has seen an increase in emissions since 1990. Um, don't get me wrong, we have done a great job reducing the peak transportation sector emissions in 2005, but um, as of 2018, it's still um, above the 1990 level. And in order to get to aggressive greenhouse gas emissions limits for 2030, uh, 2040, and 2030, 2040, and 2050, we have to do a lot more to reduce um, sectors of greenhouse gas emissions from all sectors, but especially in transportation. These, oh, sorry, I was just, if we go back to the, yeah, I was just gonna explain that uh, these greenhouse gas emissions limits for 2030, 2040, and 2050 um, were put into law um, back in March when Governor Baker signed the act creating a next generation roadmap for Massachusetts climate policy. And we are actively um, during this year and into next year developing um, a plan to meet, well, the secretary will set officially the 2030 emissions limit um, by July 1 of next year. And then we are actively um, developing a plan to achieve that emissions limit. Now I'm ready for the next uh, slide. Great. Um, so to talk about our 2050 decarbonization roadmap study that was completed last year um, and posted online at the website at the bottom of the slide there, um, just talk about our approach. Um, so the approach for the study and for decarbonization efforts, you know, overall can be summarized in these four pillars. First is to transition the uh, away from the use of fossil fuel uh, in equipment and products that require energy to operate. And then the second pillar is to reduce the usage of energy in these equipment and products, and um, also buildings as well, through pursuing energy efficiency measures and flexible load. And the third pillar is to supply um, the energy demand needed with renewable and clean energy sources, such as solar, wind. And the fourth um, pillar here is very important to achieving net zero emissions in our Commonwealth, and that's to balance remaining emissions with carbon dioxide removal from the atmosphere. And this could be um, natural waste or um, geological chemical 
um, more mechanical ways of reducing, uh, removing carbon emissions. Going to the next slide, please. We use a number of tools in our roadmap analysis to understand energy consumption in the Commonwealth. The rate of decarbonization um, that is technically feasible um, in the turnover rate of equipment and products and how much and what type of energy sources we can deploy to meet the energy demand while still meeting aggressive greenhouse gas emissions. And our approach is to keep costs low by focusing on the replacement of these equipment and products at their end of their useful life. And as you can see in these two graphs, um, images here that um, there are lots of equipment and products in the Commonwealth. Um, some of them have a longer shelf life, I guess, useful life than others by focusing the replacement of products that um, have shorter uh, useful life and more numerous, for example, uh, light bulbs, appliances, vehicles, we can do a big, we can um, have a big dent in the greenhouse gas emissions in the state. For the equipment or products that have a longer useful life, it's important to um, keep in mind like what is feasible and when they can, when they can be replaced to replace them with um, low emitting um, alternatives. Thankfully in Massachusetts, a lot of the um, equipment in the transportation sector um, that has a long uh, useful life have um, collectively a small carbon footprint in the Commonwealth. Going to the next slide, please. So this uh, graph, um, two graphs here are straight from our 2050 roadmap synthesis report. And it, it shows, I, I chose it because it shows pretty well the, um, the key findings that we need to transition away from fossil fuel ASAP um, as soon as possible. Um, you'll see that it's replacing um, these equipment with um, um, electric uh, equipment such as electric vehicles, um, electric powered heat pumps. Um, there are still some role for um, emitting sources like biomass um, and jet fuel and other fossil fuel um, for equipment that are very hard to decarbonize uh, for because of their scale or the fuel intensity that's needed to operate them, um, being that we have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions down to at least 85%, there is some wiggle room to allow these equipment to still be in operate in operation in 2050. But again, um, the bulk of the transformation needs to happen from fossil fuel to uh, more um, uh, electric alternatives, um, which can be powered by clean electricity, which you can kind of see um, on the right-hand side of this slide here of the capacity, the generation capacity needed from wind, solar, and um, other clean energy imports. I can dig into more detail about this slide if needed, but um, in the interest of time, since I only have 15 minutes, I'll focus more on the transportation sector. Um, the transform transformation needed uh, in the light duty vehicles, uh, we estimated that we need to have at least um, close to a million light duty vehicles have to be electric vehicles by, um, midway there, 2030, 2035. And uh, for our medium heavy duty, um, at least 20 or so, um, uh, 20 or so thousand uh, medium heavy duty vehicles have to be electrified um, to get to the pace needed to get to decarbonized um, um, net zero uh, carbon wealth by 2050. We did look at smart growth. Um, meaning, sorry, we did look at mode shift. And so the next two slides are looking at um, results from um, our analysis into mode shift. And so this slide here is a table um, straight from the transportation technical report. Um, it's showing you the uh, million daily vehicle miles traveled um, in Massachusetts, broken down by different RPAs. 
And this is in a reference case, reference meaning no policies, just whatever current trends now uh, carried for, uh, forward to 2050. And I colored um, here, uh, Oak Colony, um, RPA region, and um, the other regions to kind of show the different breakout between um, these regions, these categories of regions, grouping of regions. Um, so for Oak Colony, we, um, based on the social uh, economic projections by UMass Donahue Institute back in 2018. Um, and this is before the, the latest data from the uh, 2020 census. Um, Oak Colony is projected to get a about a 34% increase in population from 2015 to 2050. Um, and uh, from the EARPAT modeling that we did, we estimated that um, about uh, 34 as well percent increase in daily vehicle miles traveled um, in this uh, region. And so that works out to be about a, like a net increase of 0% uh, for the region. Um, but for the MAPC region, Central Mass and Merrimack Valley, um, I just noticed the typo, apologies for that. Um, we, we see that there is less of a big population increase, um, but because of their denser development generally, um, we see um, a more moderate increase in daily VMT um, per capita increase than, for example, um, other regional um, planning agencies. Um, for the Cape and for Pioneer Valley and um, other Western RPAs, um, some we see a, an a increase, a moderate tiny increase in population. Some see a decrease in population in the next um, 30 or so years, but uh, because there are a lot farther apart, like the density is a lot uh, lower, um, there is a more sizable increase in VMT, daily VMT um, per capita in those regions. But statewide average out to be about 12.4% uh, increase in um, daily VMT. Going, so this is again the reference case. Going to the next slide is the result by looking at various reduction measures, greenhouse gas reduction measures to lower VMT. And you can see here that we looked at different VMT um, pricing uh, policies. We also looked at um, transit policies. That's in the legend, that's what is called policy, um, but these transit policies include congestion charges, active transportation, public transit growth, and travel demand management. And you can find out more information about um, these uh, policies and their assumptions in the modeling in this technical uh, transportation technical report. It's very much consistent with the mass airport uh, analysis back in 2016. 17, I believe. Um, in addition to the transit policy um, and the VMT pricing policies, um, we also looked at density, um, densification policy. What would it take uh, to move 80% of new households in mixed use areas uh, from 2020 through 2030? And then after 2030, at least 90% of new households uh, to be located in mixed use areas. And so that's um, reflected here as well. And then we did a combination, different combinations um, of these policies. And so I wanted to bring your attention to, to um, this graph is because you can see that there is a difference in um, policy impacts depending on um, the, density, the, the existing density of the different RPAs region. Um, so for the inner core, the self, Suffolk area, you can see that because um, it's already dense, um, there are a lot of um, expected reductions uh, in VMT that we can expect from um, um, 
from policies like in trans uh, in transit oriented policy development and um, transit oriented development as well as uh, other justification policies. There's less of an impact on VMT. Uh, there's less of an impact um, to the daily VMT from pricing measures like their VMT fees. Um, alternatively, um, you can see that other regions see a, a sl uh, slightly more impact from VMT uh, fees, but not a whole lot. Um, there's only, I guess, when you're that far apart, there's only so much that you could do um, to reduce your uh, vehicle miles travel, especially when there are no um, uh, or few uh, service when it, uh, when it comes to public transportation. Um, so that's in direct, direct contrast to like the Suffolk um, region um, and the rest of the MAPC region um, that have um, more extensive public transit. And so our takeaway from this is that um, VMT measures are important, but uh, it's more important to complement them with electrification policies. And so we see um, the main policies in our portfolio is to uh, portfolio of greenhouse gas reduction measures is to electrify, but then complement it with um, VMT reduction um, uh, actions and strategies that further decrease uh, the energy usage and therefore emissions from the transportation sector. How am I doing on time? I think I have a few more minutes. Um, cool. Okay, so going on to the next slide, I'm gonna talk more about the interim clean energy and climate plan for 2030. Um, again, it's very much informed by the 2050 roadmap um, analysis. And so, um, we translate the pace of decarbonization from the roadmap study into what it takes um, to achieve. Again, this was an interim plan. So um, when it was released last December, we were targeting for a 45% reduction in emissions um, economy-wide. And so that translates to about 8 million metric tons reduction from transportation from 2017 through 2030, mostly from light duty vehicles, some reduction from medium heavy duty vehicles, but um, majority of which of the reductions are in the light duty space. Because, because, because again, one, they're, um, they have a shorter useful life, um, so their turnover rate is faster. And then there's also more of them and there's more, um, technology available now to electrify light duty vehicles. And so um, the middle column of the slide here shows you the different metrics um, that we identified as being implementation goals for us in order to achieve um, 45 emissions reduction economy-wide, but particularly a millimetric tons reduction for transportation. And so, um, uh, I can read them, but um, just wanted to highlight that um, there is some recognition that um, we need to curb light duty vehicle miles traveled to um, stabilize it at 56 billion miles a year. And this is uh, incorporating the increase in population as well um, as projected in the future. So if you look at a per capita basis, it actually is a decrease in uh, VMT per capita. Um, and then we're going up a little bit in that column is we're hoping to target a lot of the uh, VMT reduction in the commuting miles. Silver lining of COVID is that um, a lot of um, the workforce is turning to hybrid schedule or fully remote schedule. So that is really assisting us there and MassDOT is doing further analysis on the um, effects of telecommuting on both the transportation sector, transportation system, and, and um, I believe also emissions as well. Um, so in order to achieve these implementation goals, uh, quote unquote, uh, we have a list of policies to the right, um, sorry, strategies to the right here um, that we proposed in the interim 2030 um, clean, clean energy and climate plan. And I'll go to the next slide. Um, yep. 
so the next slide has those strategies, but I bulleted some of the actions that we are implementing um, to achieve, uh, to, to be consistent with those strategies. So for the first strategy is to cap transportation sector emissions and invest in our, um, invest in clean transportation solutions. And this is um, through the Transportation Climate Initiative Program. It's a regional program with Connecticut and Rhode Island and um, other states are interested as well. Um, as well, uh, the other policy levers are here that we can um, do is a low carbon fuel standard, also a regional program. More information on the TCIP program can, um, can be accessed through clicking on that link. And I assume this slide deck will be available to participants after this webinar. So you can click on that um, link. The second strategy is to implement coordinated advanced clean vehicle emissions and sales standards. And um, we're part of the 177, the section 177 states that um, have the ability to implement California's more aggressive vehicle regulations. And so um, we are closely monitoring California's advanced clean car standards too, advanced clean truck rule and advanced uh, clean feet, fleet um, rule. And so once they finalize that, we will go through our rulemaking process to implement it here in Massachusetts. And that will um, really help us uh, to achieve that 100% um, new vehicle being sold in Massachusetts being um, electric vehicles or other zero emitting uh, vehicles. In addition, we are um, a member of the 16 states who are going to um, implement a zero emission medium heavy duty action plan. Um, so the action plan is being drafted and um, we are um, implementing it once it's more finalized. And strategy number three is to reduce upfront costs of zero emission vehicle purchase cost burden. And um, the uh, Department of Energy Resources um, have, have expanded the more EV incentive program um, to include now commercial and, and non-profit uh, fleets, as well as medium heavy duty trucks. Um, and we're also looking at other programs to reduce the upfront costs of um, zero emission vehicles. Um, third, fourth strategy is to deploy um, electric vehicle supply equipment and enable smart charging. And we're doing this through the DPU's review of utility utilities uh, submitting their plans for our residential charging incentives, D uh, DCF rebates, et cetera, um, and other charging um, um, uh, rates and use cases. Um, strategy number five is to engage consumers and facilitate the market. Um, we have really close partnership with the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center, and they, um, in partnership with us, have uh, rolled out a ACT for All program. It's um, Advanced Clean Transportation for All program, um, and it's to highlight, uh, to highlight um, equity-focused transportation programs that seek to uh, increase accessibility of EVs to more consumers, as well as to um, educate um, more consumers about the benefits of EVs. And last strategy that we have in the interim plan is to stabilize light duty um, VMT and promote alternative transportation modes. And we're doing this through um, continuation of a com complete streets funding program, as well as um, smart growth resources and planning assistance grants. We um, are also uh, looking into additional measures that we can promote this particular strategy to further eke out um, additional greenhouse gas emissions. Could you go to the next slide, please? Can you go to slide 12, oh, sorry, 11? For some reason, I still see slide 10. Well, the next slide, slide 11, um, uh, shows uh, you all where are the areas that we're hoping to push additional greenhouse gas reductions to get to 50%. And the, re the, the remaining um, slides um, talks about our next steps to um, update the interim 2030 clean energy and climate plan to be the final clean energy and climate plan for 2025 and 2030. And, um, essentially has a Gantt chart and um, 
uh, commitment to having public engagement um, listening sessions um, in March of next year to talk more about our proposed emissions limits for 2030, sublimits for 2030 and 2025, and um, as well as our proposed policy portfolio to meet those emissions limits and sublimits. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we might be having some technical difficulties with our um, the screen. Charlie, uh, are you are you frozen or? Can you can you hear me, Charlie? You're you're muted, Charlie. I think we are having some technical difficulties. Please That's excuse us. Yep, we, we apologize for the technical difficulties. We're trying to, our best to, uh, to fix it. Um, looks like we have a hand raise, uh, Carlton Hunt. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much. I have three points. Uh, incidentally, I'm the, I am the Energy uh, Committee in Bridgewater, Massachusetts. I've uh, been chair for some years. Um, I wanted to, on your slide on the wind projections, the energy coming from wind and from solar, et cetera, does that include energy from rooftop, low wind velocity harvesting equipment? And this, I'll just do my three questions. Uh, under the T6, the rapid, uh, the transportation concepts and new concepts, there is a innovative above the street, solar driven rapid transit uh, system that's been developed here in Massachusetts, but I, I haven't followed it for some years, but that would solve a lot of the uh, traffic coming into towns like Bridgewater to the university. Um, and I didn't know if that kind of concept was going to get further consideration. I think it could be, uh, uh, quite frankly, uh, major transportation changing in terms of commuting. And then the third question is, uh, what do you suggest? I'm also participating in our comprehensive master plan update and have somewhat lead on the transportation. What do you suggest the comprehensive master plan uh, should include regards to the transportation efficiency. Um, I, anything like that would be helpful. I've, we've got a number of recommendations, but I'm just trying to figure out, you know, what's really do, um, for a town the size of Bridgewater and location. Thank you. I think those questions might be for Han, if if you'd like to. Sure. Uh, yeah. I think um, I think our first question, Carlton, is asking about um, the slide. Six, I believe, um, and you're asking whether, if, if I heard correctly, whether or not uh, the solar wedge in the right-hand side graph um, includes both ground mount and uh, rooftop solar. And I said yes. Um, my answer is yes. Um, in our modeling, it shows that um, the the amount of solar can be in interchangeable, like whether it's ground mount or rooftop. The the limitation, I guess our costs and uh, physical space. Um, if, so, If I might clarify, I'm not the solar, I'm talking about wind generation okay. and rooftop. Uh, to go a little bit further, here in Bridgewater, we have an inventor who's gotten a patent recently on a bird safe, bat safe rooftop wind generator. It harvests wind at about five knots and up, has automatic cutoff, it can handle basically high storm winds. Uh, and it generates, it can be, bang, be ganged up. It can generate all sorts of different uh, 40 amps, 200, 100, whatever you need. 
but it also has the ability to do DC, AC, and 220 and 110. So it's a really neat system that here in Bridgewater, we're, we're going, as far as I know, we've got an agreement in process where he can um, place it at the golf course to harvest a year's worth of wind to get a little bit more data. But I think that type of generation uh, is great for the simple reason that wind occurs around here a lot of times at night. Solar mm -hmm. doesn't work at night, but wind works 24 seven if we have a wind and especially low harvest. So I think that's the kind of thing we need to uh, start to look at in more detail. Thank you. Yeah, thanks uh, for that clarification and um, more information about that system. Uh, certainly that is very interesting and we'll be on the lookout for different uh, new technologies to supply clean and low carbon, um, carbon uh, electricity. In this particular study, we did look a lot in offshore wind just because of the um, huge amount of capacity, but that doesn't mean that we only think offshore wind is the answer. Um, so certainly we wanted to be open mind to all the different um, clean energy sources out there. And so, thank you. Um, thank, thank you for those questions. Um, and, and thank you for that presentation, Han, um, of the clean energy and climate plan and decarbonization plan and the implementation of the Global Warming Solutions Act is very important, I think, in Massachusetts um, in dealing with climate change. So um, uh, I, I want to move on for the sake of um, for the sake of time. Uh, we, we do have the other presenters who, who came in. I'm going to take them out of order because I know that um, uh, Bill Napolitano has uh, uh, we're going to, if, if you can jump to um, SERPEDS, um, can you do that, uh, Sean? Um, yes, uh, one second, please. Yep. Uh, so I'm going to try to uh, try to get the, we have a, we have a lot of, we have uh, four more presenters. So if we can uh, get them in, I, I, I'd like to. Um, so I'll, I'll go last in case we run out of time. So we don't have to, um, I'll, I'll, I'll take mine out. But um, I want to go to Bill Napolitano, and then I'm going to go to Stephen Tupper after that. Are you there, Bill? Yes, I am, Ray. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yep. And uh, Sean, you can just take your time getting it all set up there. Just make sure you got it all, and uh, we'll rock and roll with it. Sounds good. We can overcome any technological glitches, right? That's the way we got to figure. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. Okay, here we go. All right. That would be me. Okay. I'm Bill Napolitano. I'm the uh, Rivers, Trails, and Watersheds Program Manager at SERPED, and today I'm pinch hitting for Helen Zinkavich, who's our Environmental Program Manager. Um, so I'm coming at it from a, a different perspective. You have uh, a lot of obviously transportation modeling from the state end. You're going to hear from people who deal mostly with transportation following me. Um, I've been in the environmental sector for about 35 years. And you can go to the next slide. All right, this is a little bit about SERPED. There's our region in southeastern Massachusetts. Uh, we have 27 communities, cities and towns about 800 square miles, about 600,000 people. There's a lot of print on these, so I'm not gonna read everything to you. That's why I highlighted some things. And I imagine everybody will have access to the presentations later, so you can read through. And we have about 348 miles of tidal shoreline, which is really important when you're doing transportation planning, especially for the infrastructure along the coast. And you can see most of that's in Buzzards Bay, about three quarters of it. Some of it's in Narragansett Bay. We have about 90 miles of federal and interstate highways. And we have about uh, 3,300 3, miles of arterial collector and local roadways. And the mission of SERPED, and you're gonna see this from all ERPAs, the following I'm sure, is to plan for a future for Southeastern Massachusetts that includes economic, expansion of economic opportunity, protection of natural and historic resources and the development of excellent physical and cultural amenities. And this is all important. And I think a conference like this really shows how we work on an interdisciplinary basis to make all of these things happen and how climate change is really influencing how we work together to make it happen. Next slide. 
So here's my tribute to all you transportation planners. Um, air quality in the regional transportation plan, it really all starts here because what we really have to think about is working with our transportation staff as an environmental department to see how we're doing as far as um, attainment of our goals, our air quality goals. And uh, having worked for so many years with my transportation staff, I can really appreciate the effort that goes into modeling, transportation modeling section of our plans and our regional plans. So the graphic I put up here is just um, a graphic for the travel demand modeling uh, forecast. And you can see the inputs. And the last speaker really, it really kind of hit home when I was listening to everything that uh, she was summarizing. This is just for travel demand forecasting. You look at the input column, what goes in, and then the output column is kind of where things start to converge, where I can really say, where do I jump in? Where do I work with you on corridor studies, air quality planning, the whole bit? And you look, air quality emissions is right there, vehicle miles traveled, all of the things that were up on one of those charts um, that the last speaker presented. Next slide. And again, here's, here's where we all meet. Here's where the rubber meets the road for all of us. Uh, global carbon emissions. And a lot of this, this is the uh, you know, representative uh, concentration pathway for emissions in the future. And uh, that's what the RCP is for. And if we keep going the way we're going, obviously the red RCP, the 8.5, that's, that's the path of uh, worst, worst solutions, worst outcomes. Uh, we still have time to do things obviously. And some of the solutions that were uh, just discussed previously are the way to go. And hopefully we can uh, green line it. We're probably looking more towards blue lining it, but uh, again, these are the things where we really get a chance to work with our transportation staff and all of our other our comprehensive planning staff doing bylaws, um, people who deal with energy on our staff, green communities folks. So this, like I said, this is where we all converge in regional planning to try to come up with uh, climate solutions. Next slide. And this, uh, if you ever done municipal vulnerability preparedness plans, you probably use this data from the state database. This shows you just what happens with the uh, Again, the RCP at 8.5, uh, we have some tremendous temperature gains by 20, 2050 and 2090 that will definitely you know, change the course of what we do, how we do, and where we do it. Next slide. All right, so how do we work as an environmental staff with our transportation staff in a very complementary format to give you a really complete picture of what's going on in the district, and to try to come up with some solutions. Again, multidisciplinary, multi-agency. If you notice my slide said partnerships and probably for the first 33 years that I was at SERPED, I depended to, on external partners to a great degree. And right now in all of my programs that I'm working with and that Helen's working with, we probably regularly engage over three dozen partners to help meet our environmental agenda. Some of these programs go back decades um, and we still, as much as we use all the data that we can get from MassGIS, EPA, NOAA, all of the sources, standard sources, again, that we all use as RPAs and as a communities, we're still very much boots on the ground because one of the things I've always found is that you can use modeling and it can predict outcomes, but when you look at certain areas that are vulnerable or susceptible and go out and document them in the field, it really shows you how change is occurring. And sometimes it occurs very, very slowly, but monitoring over time will give you, I always say simple truths and profound clues as to which way you should proceed. And uh, that picture on the slide is actually Helen's in Cabbage down there doing some uh, culvert monitoring and uh, assessment for the town of Dighton we did the entire system in Dighton because they were in problems in certain places. Helen is a certified floodplain manager and a certified state culvert evaluator. So she leads teams out and uh, helps cities and towns that way. Probably the oldest program we have is the Geographic Roadway Runoff Inventory Program, GRIP. And it deals with flood inundation, stormwater management work. And it's where our transportation infrastructure encounters environmental areas that could be vulnerable or susceptible to flooding, uh, stormwater impacts, or whatever, even expansion, transportation corridor expansion. The next one is dam removal and river restoration projects. 
Now, I got a great slide coming up later on on this, but in southeastern Massachusetts, since 2005, we have worked again with numerous partners, uh, the Nature Conservancy, the Division of Ecological Restoration, NOAA, the USDA, cities and towns, the Watershed Alliances, Mass Audubon. Uh, we have affected the removal of eight dams, reclaimed 1,000 uh, acres of uh, floodplain and habitat and hundreds of river miles of spawning habitat too for uh, a restored fishery. We do stream continuity studies, culvert assessments. Again, there's our partners right there, Save the Bay, Mass Audubon, the Nature Conservancy, Taunton River Watershed Alliance, and many more. Um, in our area, we've surveyed now over 765 culverts, I believe was the last count. And we've done assessments and looked at vulnerabilities, what needs to be fixed. Hopefully, I mean, it's a, it's a lot of money, it's a lot of time, but maybe we can do things to help improve situations. We've also done um, flood inundation hazard reports probably for the last dozen years. And we look at tidal encroachment. Um, and we've also done uh, salt marsh studies with Save the Bay, uh, Manimate, the Wildlands Trust in our communities. And the big thing about salt marsh assessments is they provide um, obviously free ecological services for the communities, the host communities, especially around the coast. And one of the things I always remind folks on the Taunton River is that you are in an estuary, so you are a coastline. So the salt marshes are providing you with free ecological services, um, energy dissipation during tidal events and storms, um, you know, tamping, uh, same thing, tamping energy, but also carbon uh, sequestration. And a lot of people don't realize that, that the, uh, the soils, the forests, the waterways and the marshes are all part of a, pro you know, a solution to uh, the carbon problem. And then we have uh, green infrastructure considerations in our open space planning and resiliency in our master plans. And two of the tools that have been developed in recent years, one of them through our partners at Manimet, that's kind of been taken to the state level by Mass Audubon is the green infrastructure mapping for the state. And it's a fabulous, fabulous tool and it really opens some eyes in uh, communities. And you'll see an example of a slide coming up. And then uh, resiliency and master plans. I mean, we've been talking about things, you know, managed retreat, um, coastal, coastal buffering, living shorelines. Um, again, hopefully these are things that can be integrated into all of the planning community-wide into regional plans. So we can come up with some cooperative types of solutions. And then we're integrating uh, recommendations found in open space plans, transportation plans, MVP plans. The MVP program has been a real blessing and it's really helped to open some community eyes and they've been great as far as putting money into potential solutions and further study that's really needed. Hazard mitigation plans, and then um, others such as uh, the Taunton River Watershed uh, Climate Adaptation Plan, which again was uh, done through Manimet and several of our partners a few years ago. Next slide. And again, on the state level, this is, this is where we all come together, climate mitigation, climate adaptation, and hazard mitigation. And you see what we're looking for, these cross-cutting strategies. And a lot of it is what we deal with as planners, again, from the community level all the way up to the regional level. Talking smart growth, uh, community outreach, engagement, and education, which is crucial. If you want people to own the plans or create living plans, people have to understand what we're trying to help them with. Uh, my, my motto in the environmental program has always been we plan with people, not at them. And that's the way we approach everything. So you can see where things intersect here. And um, these are the approaches we really have to use going forward. And these are the approaches that are pretty much inherent to what we do. Next slide. So what do we do with our integrated planning? Well, we're starting to, um, do our land use and transportation planning, you know, um, integrating that with everything we do, but we're also talking about improving the quantity and quality of public transit service. And wherever we can, and this is especially in uh, shared use path planning, bike planning, uh, circulation studies, even sidewalks and walking, you know, accessibility, wherever we can um, provide more alternatives, we can hope to reduce greenhouse gas emissions benefit underserved communities and vulnerable communities. 
And the environmental program, we've been integrating um, recommendations from MVP, hazard mitigation, green infrastructure mapping, corridor plans uh, into local open space master plans, regional watershed plans, and other studies and updates over the past several years. One of the things that um, I, I've really enjoyed doing is we've worked with the EPA on several pilot projects over the years. And uh, back in 2018, 2017, 2018, we had a chance to work with um, the EPA uh, piloting the Watershed Management and Optimization Support Tool, or WMOST, in the wading and Three Mile River watersheds. Uh, they were looking to integrate some of the transportation data that we'd done down to the TAS level through a community visa application uh, to see what kinds of solutions that they could uh, help this particular watershed come up with for stormwater management. And again, it was, it was a great process. We, did, uh, we gave them our transportation data and from the planning end of it, we uh, kind of supplemented the traffic models with a little bit more detail, you know, granular, says granular um, inputs for the car, you know, specific things that the EPA was asking for that we had. And one of the great outcomes of this was, even though this was a pilot project, it showed the value of nature-based solutions, retaining the natural environment, uh, mimicking the natural environment, you know, with uh, stormwater features along roadways as being probably the most cost-effective and beneficial solutions to uh, stormwater and flooding in this particular sub-watershed area. Now, I know they're uh, beefing this up and it's actually, right now, this watershed is uh, part of a, a flow study uh, process with the EPA that we're also participating in. Next slide. And here's another um, example of something we're doing when we're integrating studies. This is a map uh, from the Marion Open Space Plan forthcoming. And it combines uh, recommendations, again, from our recently completed Route 6 corridor study, which was regional, four towns, the Marion Master Plan, South Coast Bikeway, and intermunicipal shared use pathway plans. And what we threw in here was we always check with our transportation folks. At the time that we started doing this study, uh, the uh, New Bedford to Wareham bus route was going to increase its capacity and service times. And they're also bicycle friendly. So we factored that in when we were talking about locating particular features in the bike ped options for the town of Marion. And it worked out beautifully. In fact, uh, Mattapoisett is working on an extension of one of their bike paths right now that incorporates this transit feature in. And again, I said it before, but you know, by affording more transit and transportation options and alternatives, hopefully you know, we can make a dent in the, uh, the emissions uh, in this region. Next slide. And here's one of the things that um, I know I've been pushing for several years and it's really coming up now. In fact, uh, we just finished a study in Plimpton. Again, it's funded through an MVP action grant. And we've been putting this in all of our open space plans and now into master plans too. You know, retention of critical green infrastructure and transportation corridor planning and along existing corridors throughout the region is crucial. You look at areas of heavy congestion um, and you see, you know, adjacent forest land um, adjacent woodland, waterways, everything. But forests in particular sequester about 14% of the state's gross annual carbon emissions. That's just a fact. And an average acre of forest land stores about 85 tons of carbon. And as forests age, this capacity increases. One of the things I was talking with our transportation director about is that we have the green infrastructure mapping for the Commonwealth now, like I said, Mass Audubon has that. I don't know if they have released it or are going to release it very shortly for every community. It would be good to revisit our regional transportation plan, our corridor plans, corridor improvement, corridor expansion plans, and see where this critical green infrastructure exists so that we don't lose it. Again, these are free carbon mitigation services, ecological services that are provided by nature. So we're actually incorporating the resiliency built into nature to complement our gray infrastructure when we do this. Next slide. 
And this is another great one too, where we've actually used green infrastructure maps. New Bedford is working on um, a resilience plan, um, actually an upgrade and increase in the city. And CERPED staff provided the green infrastructure network map that you see on the slide. And uh, this one for soil organic carbon uh, on the following slide. But this is in order to help the city plan uh, for carbon and GHG balance in an adjacent north-south corridor along Route 18, Ashley Boulevard of Christian Avenue, which is heavily traveled. The large green area in the middle of that with the um, green infrastructure map is the uh, Christian at, um, Cedar Swamp. It's a national landmark swamp. But believe it or not, we've actually had development proposals in there for over the years and you know they haven't gone anywhere. But the lighter green around there is actually unprotected um, green infrastructure, mostly forest land that could be acquired and probably should be acquired to, um, again, help achieve that balance in the corridor. Next slide. And this is the uh, estimated carbon pool for New Bedford, the soil organic carbon. And I have to uh, give some credit here to, um, in fact, a shout out really to uh, the State Healthy Soils Action Plan. And I've been working with Jim Newman of uh, Linnaean, who's uh, one of the principal contractors uh, on the State Healthy Soils Action Plan. And hopefully that will be coming out shortly. But if you look at this, carbon sequestration in soils, and if you look at that dark brown right there, that's where the, the uh, swamp was in the previous slide. That's because there's a load of peat in there. And, uh, you know, like Arby says, we have the meat. Well, if you have the peat, then you're storing a lot of carbon and you don't want to disrupt that. But you look at other opportunities that on the soils map would kind of ring the forest as well, incorporate the forest, but ring the forest as well. And this is something the city should realize because I think, you know, a lot of times the cities look at themselves as being so densely populated and so heavily built out that there's not really the potential to come up with any nature-based solutions or practical, you know, ecological-based solutions to, um, you know, work on uh, not just greenhouse gases, but the other, uh, car, you know, climate change impacts. So again, hopefully this report will be coming out shortly too. It's a great, great tool. Next slide. And this is just the graph. I've, um, I wanted to put this in here to show you kind of like the big four as far as uh, soil carbon stocks, forest land, salt marsh, seagrass, obviously of our coastal guys, and uh, peatland. And peatland is huge. And again, when we did, uh, when we worked with Plimpton recently, Plimpton has so much uh, bog land, cranberry bogs, active and inactive, that they were amazed at, um, you know, they were looking at climate solutions, just how much they already had going for them and how much nature provided. Next slide. So what are the types of work are we doing? Our related work in our urban and rural roads and waterways, like I said, we do the flood hazard inundation work and the top right hand slide is uh, Old Providence Road in Swansea. That's flooding on a normal tidal event. And we've been working with them for years. I've been monitoring when you, when you talk about, you know, kind of boots on the ground and monitoring. I've been looking at that site for over 15 years now. And we actually have a sunny day tidal event that we did on a GoPro camera. And it is absolutely amazing. No wind, no clouds, nothing. And the water comes up over the road the same way. So this is something obviously when the, the bridge was rebuilt and it was redone not that long ago in, in the early 2000s, we have to start paying attention to benchmarks when we rebuild structures and build to new benchmarks. But this is something you know, that we're dealing with there. And then the, the town conservation agents have been great. So is the police department as far as public safety. Um, Dam removals and river restoration work. That's a slide directly below. That's the Mill River um, at the state hospital in Taunton. So the state property was the first one to jump in. And what used to be a dam there, this is the early stages of it. After the dam was first removed, the river channel was restored. You can tell we still have um, some of the mat down and uh, some planting, stake plantings in there. But this is what the river looked like. I can show you a little more in a minute. And on the right-hand side, the lower right, this is um, a marsh assessment with Save the Bay in Freetown. Again, this is in an estuary. 
So this is something that's actually going to provide, does provide ecological services to the towns. But looking at it on a map with GIS data, you might say, oh, there's a ton of marsh out there. But you don't know what state the marsh is in. Is it healthy? Are there things that we can do to help enhance the health of the marsh or allow it to um, migrate? Does it need to migrate up into an upland area? Do we need to secure more land? So going out and doing this type of thing, you know, every once in a while you get your boots muddy and your pants wet, depending on which uh, pair of waders you put on. Next slide. Charlie. I'm sorry. I'm I'm no, sorry. check. See, like, check this out, right? Um, this is just some more examples. This is a, a wave damping assessment, the first slide that we did in Berkeley uh, to talk about um, the ecological services provided by Marsh. And uh, we did that again with Save the Bay and the Wildlands Trust because they were actually property, property owners along there as well as Bristol County Agricultural High School. The middle slide is actually Waterfront Park in uh, Somerset and we've done some work down there and some subsequent work with the state to make park improvements in the community. Um, there is a parking lot under that water. And that's, again, that's a title event. And then uh, the last slide is um, climate change and sea level rise work that we've done in uh, Dighton. And that's right around, again, the uh, Bristol County Agri Agricultural High School. And we were looking at maybe um, changing the mowing patterns in the lower field to allow for marsh migration to help um, offset tidal surge, storm surge, and allow the, the um, existing marsh to uh, migrate back a little bit to provide more protection to that bend in the river. Next slide. This is one, probably one of my favorite projects of all time. Uh, we worked with the Division of Ecological Restoration and 19 other partners to affect uh, dam removals along the Mill River. And in the course of the project, we did three dams, um, worked with MassDOT on a fourth that had to be revamped on Lake Sebatia. But on that one, we put in fish passage, a fish ladder and an eel ladder. Um, but this one is the state hospital dam. This was the first one out of the, out of the box. The top slide, the top left, if you go from the top left down to the bottom uh, right, that's 2012. And actually we'd started this project in 2010, getting all the permits, studies and the whole bit. But that's the dam as existed in 2012. It was an old industrial dam, had no use, no use for many, many years. And uh, it just created an impoundment, a shallow impoundment behind it, it impeded the flow of the river. It had impacted the um, riverside buffer, forest vegetation, obviously wildlife, fish passage. So it was doing a lot of things that it shouldn't be doing. The second slide is obviously the dam removal slide. And that's again, 2012. The third slide, the lower left is 2014. And that's when we, um, we actually got out, we, we used to um, monitor the river. Uh, you see a little bit of growth coming in. We went and did uh, hand removal of invasives. We did um, hand planting and we actually did some uh, raking and seeding. And the last slide, it, and these are all the same view of the river, by the way, this last slide is 2018. We have a beautiful streamside forest coming in. We have beautiful flow. We have fish passage, everything that you would want. And the benefit here is when people were first looking at this, they said, okay, you restore flow. You've uh, limited, one of the big things on this river too is it was a flood scare in 2005, if any of you remember, there was a huge flood scare when um, the Whittenden Mills Dam, a little farther up the river, we removed that one too, uh, looked like it was gonna breach and you know flood the city of Taunton. So that precipitated all of this. But it's not just the flood abatement. Here we've reclaimed floodplain, we've reclaimed streamside forest, we've normalized the river channel and allowed it to flow the way it was intended to. We've enhanced wildlife, we've restored wildlife corridors. But again, the ecological services provided by the forest and the floodplain are also helping us address air quality issues. Um, and this is right on the outskirts of, of a major downtown. Next slide. And this is the map. Um, and this is just on the Mill River. Uh, I was talking about this. We, um, 
Here we've restored 30, 30 river miles and 400 acres of spawning habitat. And the dam in this picture is actually uh, the last one we removed. It's on West Britannia Street where the old Reed and Barton facility was. The top picture is the dam. The second picture is um, of the restored river. And we have um, the map shows us the uh, three dams that were removed and the fourth dam that was enhanced. And again, in this region, we've been very lucky. I mean, to, to have the, uh, you know, the eight dam removals in the past 13 years is pretty amazing. And the amount of uh, habitat that's been restored is also pretty amazing. And all of the restoration, it, it goes to help us again, not only with um, habitat, floodplain reclamation, wildlife cars, but also with um, addressing area pollution and water pollution. Next slide. And this is another one of the projects um, down on the Palmer River in um, Swansea, where again, they were experiencing floods. This is just south of the old Providence Bridge slide that I showed you before. Uh, this was a partnership to uh, preserve some agricultural land that was going to be up for sale and potentially uh, converted to residential land. But it was behind some marshland that was owned by the Wildlands Trust. Uh, the Barrington Land Trust uh, had land on the other side of it. So this property was picked up uh, through the efforts of a private um, entity, the Blount Fine Foods, working with the Wildlands Trust and the town of Swansea through um, community preservation money. And the best thing there is, again, it preserved um, marshland. In fact, next slide, we can go to the next slide. It's right in the Route 6 corridor, right adjacent to the Route 195 corridor as well. In fact, you can see the Route 6 um, corridor right to the top of the slide. It helped us retain identified green infrastructure in the area that contributes, again, to the dissipation of energy associated with storm, extreme tidal and flood events, and contributes to carbon sequestration. It increased the amount of conservation land protected in perpetuity in the area along the Palmer. This added almost, in total, 100 acres in properties. It added to the retention of uh, stream continuity and habitat connectivity between the parcels and the coastal river. And it eliminated threats to water quality due to development in an area of the river just below. There's a desal plant on the Palmer River. So first, it provides a good deal of the water to Swansea. So uh, this is, again, key to protect the water quality below the intake of the desal plant. And one of the best things about this project is, uh, it happened several years ago, but um, in the context of what we're trying to do here, we now have an opportunity to pick up in the lower right-hand corner of this slide, you see more marshland. Uh, that may become available and we're working with the town, uh, the Nature Conservancy, the Wildlands Trust again, and it may be an interstate effort because you're right here at the edge of the um, uh, Swansea and uh, Rhode Island state border. And uh, we may be able to pick up some acreage in Rhode Island too. We're working with partners in Rhode Island as well. The, the Rhode Island Nature Conservancy is working with the town. So uh, this could lead to some really great things on both sides of the river. Next slide. And kind of looking down the road, this is a picture of uh, the Route 1 corridor, 495 corridor in Plainville. That's Lake Miramichi. It really kind of gives you a panoramic view of everything we have and everything we should plan to protect and everything that really enhances a corridor. But um, we have several projects. Room to Grow, which I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about in a minute. We're also working in the Masket River, again, to do a lot of the things I was talking about today. And we're working on Assawampsit Pond's Watershed Climate Action Plan. Uh, and it's a fabulous effort, a lot of public involvement. The Namaska River study and the Aswamsit Pond study should be done in June of uh, 2022. Uh, you can go to our website. There's uh, links to project pages. And we're also just in the process of kicking off a SERPID regional resiliency plan. And we have about uh, 50 partners that we've uh, started to contact to help us really advise us on uh, how to, what to, when to, and where to within our district. We want to make this as inclusive as possible. Uh, the first project, the Room to Grow, is really neat. We've been looking at um, 
something that probably was overlooked for a long time, especially in the context of the uh, carbon sequestration in soils, the slides I showed you earlier. Uh, we're working with um, a legislative office in the Southeast, our partners at the Southeastern Massachusetts Agricultural Partnership and a few others to document soils, prime agricultural soils and soils of statewide importance, as well as carbon critical soils in the um, phase one of the South Coast Rail Corridor to see what impact secondary development would have on losing those soils. And the thing there is if you're promoting regional resilience and looking at our newly completed food policy plan, food policy and safety plan, as well as the food assessment plan, part of being resilient is having the ability to grow your own food. And it's not just the ability to grow your food, but obviously you wanna retain those soils that are actually helping to contribute to carbon sequestration. So it's a great project. We've actually presented, it, it's still in a, um, a work in proce process, but we've presented to the uh, state's interagency uh, land committee, the Southeastern Massachusetts legislative delegation, the CMAP annual meeting, a couple of the towns, town of Westport, uh, SERPED meeting. So, um, you know, stay tuned for that one, but hopefully we'd like to be able, be able to apply in all of our corridor planning uh, corridor enhancement plans, you know, any expansion. And I, I think it'll be a great tool. And again, it's all based on partnerships. Uh, you find out you can't do anything alone. That's for sure. And that's all I got. Thank you, Bill. Um, we have a number of questions. However, we are running behind. Um, we're at already over an hour. Um, that was a that was an excellent um, uh, presentation on what's happening at in, in Serped. So I, I want to thank uh, thank you, Bill, and I want to thank Stephen Tupper for his um, patience. Um, so I'm I'm going to do um, questions at the end of, of everything. So I'm I'm going to put Stephen Tupper on next if he's ready to uh, go. That he's with the Cape Cod Commission. Are, are you there, Stephen? Yes, ready to go. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. While we get the slides up, I'll get started. So again, thank you for having me on the panel today. Happy to follow a couple of great presentations and look forward to the others this evening or this afternoon. So if you want to go to the next slide, I'll just give a quick overview of the Cape Cod Commission. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the regional planning agency down on Cape Cod. So relatively small in terms of a regional planning agency, but also certainly on the front lines of some of the things that we're seeing with the change in climate and um, quite a bit of coastline for a relatively small region. On the next slide here, so I wanted to share the mission of the Cape Cod Commission um, and highlight two things in particular, certainly the need to balance environmental protection and economic progress. So this has been our mission from the beginning, but certainly climate change has really put those two, uh, two balanced areas in, uh, in, in really a, in a threat. So the climate change is pre presenting a threat both in terms of environmental protection and economic progress. So while we've been um, addressing climate throughout our uh, history, certainly focus in more recently, I'd like to talk, touch on just a few initiatives um, within the climate um, work that the commission does. So I'll touch on a couple of topics here, uh, having to do with data information, engagement, and the development of our climate action plan, some resources, and I'll introduce the idea of funding, although really that'll be a conversation um, for the coming years. So certainly just go on that briefly. Again, I'll touch on a number of topics. So today, really just um, a brief um, information. And then if anyone's interested in digging deeper, everything I'll be talking about today is available on our website at capecodcommission.org slash climate. So you'll see references there, um, including a podcast. So it's my first podcast. I'd love that to go viral. So go ahead and hop on and take a look at that. But with that on the next slide, I just wanted to focus in on some of the data and information that really underlies a lot of the work that we do. So starting with the greenhouse gas emissions inventory. So as we um, got into more detailed discussion on climate, we wanted to make sure that we had a good baseline of what's going on in the region. And certainly as RPAs, we deal with many controversial topics um, and there's a lot of misinformation out there, particularly dealing with the climate. So I wanted to make sure we had a good baseline. Um, so um, following on the work done by the state and also models put together by other RPAs, I want to look at specifically what's happening within the Cape Cod region. And as you can see on, in the graphic here, 
transportation sector clearly rose to the top in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. And we also went through and documented contributions from all of the other sectors. And as was highlighted in the previous presentation, certainly focused on the importance of carbon sequestration from our natural environment, both in our area, the forest lands, and also the coastal marsh that certainly will play an important part going forward. I wanna spend just a couple more slides on the transportation sector. So on this next slide here, you'll see a little more information specifically about the emissions from the transportation sector. It's probably no surprise to the folks on this panel here, the on-road emissions leads to the um, transportation sector. It's really that driving that we do every day um, that um, equates to the issue in the transportation sector. And is a real challenge because it really goes down to personal choice in terms of a lot of these, although it's really an unfair, uh, unfair word to use personal choice in some of the areas where we don't have a lot of choice in terms of transportation modes. We'll get into that in a little bit there. But I did also wanna highlight this emissions inventory was um, put together with a technical advisory group, certainly helping us along the way. And then within the GHG inventory, we drilled down into the, each of the topics and there's a um, quite a bit on our website about that. But here, just focusing on the transportation side, looking at the roads that are traveling um, throughout our region. This is just a breakdown of the um, vehicles registered in Barnstable County. We also look at those that were visiting the region, certainly important. Um, but the takeaway here, as is the case in other places, um, predominantly internal combustion engine, not a lot of electric vehicles. Um, really, that's resulting in the high emissions that we're seeing from the transportation sectors today. Um, so certainly something that we're targeting going forward. But really, the greenhouse gas emissions inventory just set the baseline. And what we are talking about is what is going to happen next. So on the next slides here, we'll walk through uh, another initiative that we um, undertook to really set the data behind the story. And that was a emission uh, economic and fiscal impact analysis. So really putting the numbers behind what's going on um, in our region in terms of the impacts that we're going to face in the coming decades. You can see on the slide a number of the topics um, that we touched on. But again, we want to look forward. So we came up with a number of different emissions, um, future emission scenarios and working with a consultant looked at what would happen under a number of different scenarios. Um, one being the um, simple business as usual and then what happens as a region if we take some um, specific strategies um, going forward in terms of electrification or efficiency? And really, what does that mean in terms of some of the underlying numbers? What happens if we put X number of um, electric vehicles into our fleet? What happens with um, some combination of weatherization and heat pumps? Really put the numbers behind um, what could happen in terms of a potential future scenario. So we have some data to talk about. And the last slide here in terms of the economic and fiscal impact analysis, we wanted to quantify um, some of these scenarios. What is the cost of doing nothing, which in many cases was quite um, informative and quite um, uh, disheartening in some cases, but also looked at cost benefit analysis for some of the adaptation strategies and the mitigation strategies that um, were investigated as part of this process. Um, so that really, when we could start to look at our futures, we'd have the numbers behind it. But as we alluded to earlier, the numbers only get you so far. So those um, analyses are really just to form the conversations that were part of the development of our climate action plan, um, which was formed with a really a community conversation. So I'll spend just a couple of slides talking about the Cape Cod Climate Action Plan, as is highlighted, or as is shown on the cover here on the next slide. Um, so really there's been a lot of good climate initiatives throughout um, Cape Cod and from the public side and the advocacy group. The Climate Action Plan was really an opportunity to bring together a diverse stakeholder group. So when we put together this plan, it represented not just an advocacy perspective, um, but really brought in all the important players and made sure that it set a, a plan, an action plan, action being the key word um, for the coming years to come. So on the next slide here is the purpose statement of the Cape Cod Climate Action Plan. I won't read through it, but the important part was that it was really science-based and it set up um, strategies for a number of different actors. Um, so the Cape Cod Commission had a subcommittee that guided this process so we could have some um, regular um, guidance on how we wanted to direct the policy. But ultimately it's a set of potential actions to both deal with climate resilience, climate adaptation and climate mitigation. Um, so really that was the overall purpose of the study and guided a lot of our work in this area. On just on one slide, I could have spent quite a bit of time here on the stakeholder process just to highlight the diverse group of individuals and organizations that were represented, we certainly spoke directly with our municipalities, had a series of um, working groups that engaged a broader um, community, 
and then focus groups that went into each of the different subject matters to make sure we really drilled into that um, and continue to communicate with those different groups. And then not highlight on this slide, but kind of a different effort. We also had a climate ambassadors program where we worked specifically with individuals um, in our um, regional um, and local high schools to start to make that connection across the age spectrum. Um, so the outcome of all these activities highlighted on the next slide here was an action plan with a series of um, strategies. Um, here highlighted, and I won't go through each of them, I'll just focus on the transportation ones, are the 11 priority strategies. Those are the ones that based on our work had the most potential for um, positive outcomes and were really important to meet, meeting the climate goals that um, were established in this plan. Um, I also wanna highlight that under each strategy, there's a whole series of actions um, as well as specific steps and identified actors that would need to play a part in that. So of course at the RPA, we are not the ones to implement many of these things. We rely on the municipalities, individuals, businesses, nonprofits, a whole range of actors and also um, up the chain rely on actions at the state and federal level. So the plan really details the roles of all of those different actors in these strategies. On the next two slides, I'll focus specifically on the priority strategies related to transportation. So the first is to reduce vehicle miles traveled to support low and no carbon transportation options. These were things that um, at the RPA we'd already been focusing on, certainly looking at the importance of public transit, investments in our bike and pedestrian networks um, and travel demand management strategies. But it was really putting it in a climate context. Um, so when we see climate, when we see advocates out there advocating for a bike path, it's just another quill um, in the quiver in terms of reasons why these investments are important. Um, so these are some of the um, actions identified under this priority here. And then the second strategy related to transportation is to accelerate the electrification of the transportation system. So undoubtedly, this would be one of the most effective in terms of um, driving down greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so we go into some of the strategies and some of the actions specifically under this area. Um, we also went into a bit of a deeper dive and I'll touch on that later in terms of how this happens and making sure that it happens in an equitable way. Certainly there's unique geographic challenges um, for each of the regions. So um, how that rolls out um, from some really important statewide programs happens differently region by region. So next I wanna move into a couple of the tools um, that we've developed since the Climate Action Plan. And I could do a whole presentation on any of these, um, but I'll just give a, a quick snap, snapshot here. And then certainly um, offline, happy to follow up um, with any questions here and happy to um, certainly have everyone explore these on our website. So first is a siting analysis that we did for electric vehicle charging stations. Um, so we started out with a simple inventory of all the stations out there. There are certainly a number of consumer tools that can be used to identify where the stations are. But we dug a bit deeper and um, did some site visits as well to under, uncover some of the issues um, with the stations. And then I'd say more importantly, identify some of the gaps in our network. So both in terms of geographic gaps, um, where there was a lack of charging infrastructure, particularly for the visitors to our region. We know most charging happens at home, but if you're here on vacation or here for work, that, that option doesn't exist for you. Um, and then we really spent a lot of time tying into our planning work making sure they're understanding the places where people wanted to spend longer periods of time, community activity centers where there's um, large destinations, and seeing what, the, um, what sort of network existed in those locations and certainly found some deficiencies and helped to prioritize future investments because certainly we're going to need quite a bit more infrastructure to meet the anticipated demands. And then the second tool that I wanted to highlight actually isn't up on our website because it just finished last week, but it will be very shortly. And that's a story map um, talking specifically about managed retreat. So that was mentioned earlier. Um, and certainly this is something that um, many Cape communities are grappling with, but it's a challenging conversation, particularly if you're talking about abandoning um, a resource. Um, so the story map goes through the number of different adaptation strategies and kind of describes what the pros and cons of them are and presents fact sheets to give some more information. It also presents local examples so you can see what's happening within our region and in the area. Certainly there's some um, visually interesting examples of things going on on the coastline um, in terms of managed retreat. It also includes best management practices for environmental messaging and a specific communication strategy because um, those can be some pretty tough conversations to have um, and so really providing some guidance on there. And then lastly, it highlights some other existing tools um, that are helpful in these conversations, including the Commission's Sea Level Rise Viewer, 
um, and a coastal planner application that really allows for testing for different scenarios for solutions. And yes, you can go ahead to that last slide there. <laughs> I'm onto my last slide at this point. And just to highlight that funding is really the next piece. Um, so this really sets the framework for action. Now we're going to be working with a number of partners to implement um, some of the actions identified in the plan, because really we're at that point now. We really need to um, implement a number of these strategies in order to get to the climate future we want, not some of the um, really dire futures that were um, looked at in some of the analyses. So I know I went through that quickly, but happy to um, follow up either in this setting or certainly afterwards if there's any questions. Thank you, Stephen. I know that story map is, is a really great tool. We actually have one on our website for our, our um, climate change transportation vulnerability study. And uh, we're going to update that and actually we're gonna use it for other, other studies too. So that, that's a great tool. Thank you for that presentation. Um, I'm gonna move on to, our, um, to Martin Hillsbury from MAPC. Thank you very much. Uh, You're welcome. Uh, I see your slides up and running, so thank you. So uh, my name is Martin Pillsbury. I am the Director of Environmental Planning at the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. And um, I just want to um, shout out to Bill Napolitano uh, because uh, he mentioned that he'd been working for uh, 30 odd years. I forget how many he said. I have to admit to being a Johnny come lately because I think I started about one year after he did. Uh, but we are sort of of the same cohort, uh, and we've actually had the chance to collaborate off and on over the years, which has always been a great, a, a great pleasure. Uh, and so uh, if you can move on to the next slide, uh, I'm just going to give an overview. This is a kind of quick table of contents of what the presentation uh, includes today for MAPC, an uh, overview of our climate adaptation types of technical assistance we do with communities, climate programs and resources and tools that we have. Uh, we'll then also talk a little bit of our, our, our new regional plan, uh, Metro Common uh, 2050, and the climate priorities are within that, uh, and a little bit about our climate advocacy and policy work. And um, I guess we may not have time for uh, questions and answers within each, each one of these, but maybe there'll be a time in general at the end. Uh, go ahead to the next slide. So just uh, to get established for folks to be familiar with MAPC, uh, Eastern Mass, uh, area around Greater Boston, 101 uh, municipalities in the region. Uh, that's such a big beast that we've actually divided it into eight subregions to have a more manageable level of interaction and conversation with similar, more similar groups within different parts of the region. Um, this overall region uh, includes about over a little over three million residents and about. Uh, 1.8 million jobs, but that's as of, of, as of the last census. I haven't yet had a chance to grab the new census, in, but uh, wouldn't be surprised if, me if that in 10 years later is upwards of 2 million jobs. That's just a sketch, thumbnail sketch of the region as a whole. Go ahead to the next slide. Um, so uh, our involvement in climate it, it spans uh, both uh, what you would call the mitigation and the adaptation sides of the ledger. Uh, we have a number of, act of uh, projects and activities that are around greenhouse gas reduction and climate mitigation uh, and climate action plans and sort of that thing. Th those are actually not mostly in our department. We have a separate department of what we call the clean energy department that mostly does those sorts of projects. And then most of the adaptation and resilience planning types of projects are in the environment department. That's my department. Uh, so a few of the things that we'll talk about a little bit more detail here, uh, our climate resilient land use strategies tool, um, things like the MVP planning and climate resilience plans locally and their ha and activities with integrating climate into our regional, uh, into our hazard mitigation plans. Uh, those are a few things I'll highlight a, a little bit more on as we go ahead. So, so go on to the next slide. So just a quick uh, check in on where do our member communities stand and the kinds of activities that are going on or that they are getting involved with relating to climate. So this little infographic is showing us that uh, about 21 of our municipalities out of 101 um, have or are developing climate action plans. About a third of them um, uh, have adopted goals to reduce, reduce greenhouse gas emissions community-wide. About two thirds of them uh, have volunteer committees dedicated to climate sustainability or energy issues and 100 of the 101 uh, are certified uh, MVP communities so 
Um, you do the math. I'm, I, it's just, since it's only one community that hasn't, I won't name them. Uh, but we're actually working with, uh, on getting them into, into the program this year. Uh, go into the to the next slide. So just a few examples of some of the resources and, and projects that we have completed and, and are available. Uh, we have a step-by-step -step guide to greenhouse gas uh, inventorying for communities. And we have worked with many communities on that, and some of them have taken guides like this and worked on their own. Uh, we have developed more recently a municipal net zero playbook. Uh, the climate perspectives was a, a project we had of, of interviewing in-depth uh, workers in several sectors about the impacts of climate change on their work, uh, like construction and landscape outdoor workers, as well as home health care workers and that sort of thing, to get ideas of, of how climate change is affecting uh, them and or the clients they work with. Uh, and we have a, an uh, arts program, um, arts and culture program that is getting, getting involved with a number of different of our environmental and other planning projects to, to put a pr different perspective on these issues and to use arts as a, partly as a means of better uh, outreach and engagement uh, with, with the people on, on issues that sometimes we only seem to talk like we're technical people and know that, that doesn't always translate to, to, for everyone. Uh, so that's a few examples. All of these projects are on our, our website. And go ahead to the next um, slide. Uh, and then this is the one I wanted to spend a little bit more time on because um, this was just literally hot off the press. It's completed last month. Uh, and it, it's a toolkit or it's a, it's a set of uh, examples and resources on communities, uh, uh, tools communities can use through their land use and planning to integrate climate uh, into their into their local regulatory systems. Uh, and so this was based on research and calling out some of the best examples from around the state and a few from beyond the state on the kind of kind of category. So a lot of planners in the room here, so these are all gonna sound like familiar categories, floodplain overlays and, and zoning, uh, stormwater regulations, wetland, wetlands, site plan review, water conservation, uh, tree protection, that's becoming a bigger, bigger issue. Uh, uh, not only in our urban communities, but even some of the communities that already seem to be tree rich, uh, concerned about staying that way, uh, design, and, uh, design and standards and guidelines. So there's a lot of, it, there's a lot of resources here. Uh, we literally just put this up on our website and Ann Herbst, who's the author of this, is our, our principal environmental planner, uh, um, is going actually around and doing a little bit of a roadshow onto some of our subregions and other partner agencies just to make them aware of this as a resource. I, I think most of these have ap applicability through the whole state because we all work to the same zoning codes and same zoning, uh, you know, it's not, it's not MAPC, MAPC specific. In fact, some of the better examples that Ann called to, to use and hold up could, could, uh, could come from other communities around the whole state, probably for some of your regions uh, that, that, are, that are shown as uh, good examples of this kind of thing. So uh, that's, a, that's a newly published resource. I encourage folks to take a look at that. Uh, go ahead to the next slide. Um, so the kinds of planning activities and technical assistance uh, we get engaged with in our communities around, and this is more on the climate adaptation in most cases side of things. Um, uh, it, we've been working to uh, integrate climate into the hazard mitigation planning. Uh, probably most of the other RPAs here, I think, have done a lot of those kind of hazard mitigation plans because MEMA has has actually, you know, set a priority for having the RPAs be service providers for those in many cases. Um, we have conducted, out of the 101 towns, over 90 hazard mitigation plans since the program started, and which was a while ago now. The program started in about 2003 or four. Uh, and at first, there was no climate mentioned in these plans at all. FEMA's guidelines didn't even have the word climate anywhere in them. Even though we were talking about storms and coastal erosion, it was all based on backcasting and what, you know, uh, demonstrate what your threats are by the historic trends of what you've seen happen already, you know, which is fine. You need to build up your baseline, your empirical information, but they didn't, they weren't forward looking in terms of how these very same kinds of natural hazard events will be different and in most cases worse or more frequent in the future. So clearly the state gets it now, the last 2018 state level hazard mitigation plan integrates climate into it. FEMA, even though they haven't officially changed their guidelines sort of at the staff level, uh, gets it and supports the idea that these plans can be a platform that, that get into climate as well. Uh, and so we've been trying to do more of that in the plans that we've conducted over the last three or four years or so. 
uh, and, and then also when towns have also been doing the, the next second item here, uh, uh, the, the MVP, as I mentioned, a hundred of the towns and cities in our region have done the MVP process. We've personally worked with about 21 of them. Uh, and where there's a lot of potential um, synergy between what comes out of the MVP process and what can go into the hazard mitigation plans in terms of uh, the MVP being main methods of a, a community engagement in identifying both problems and identifying potential solutions. Uh, although being a little bit less technical and less formal than a hazard mitigation plan, uh, Ann Herbs, uh, my <laughs> principal planner, likes to say the MVP is a great process to crowdsource uh, climate issues in the community. Uh, it, the HMPs are more rigorous in some certain sense, the way FEMA requires them to be, but you can they, they can actually talk to each other. And a few communities in the last few years have actually done the two of them together to come up with a more of an integrated approach, which makes a lot of the sense. Uh, we've also had the opportunity to provide more detailed technical assistance for local vulnerability, climate vulnerability assessments and climate resilience plans for just a handful of communities, a few on the South Shore, uh, Duxbury, uh, situated Braintree, as well as Brookline and Newton over the last few years. So that go, they'll go, those go into a lot more detail and technical analysis than you do in a typical MVP or HMP. Uh, and we've um, also begun using the kinds of tools that I, in that toolkit I just mentioned, we've worked with some communities on updating their regulations and bylaws and incorporating climate change. We're working one or two communities where we're trying to uh, work climate change concerns and resilience concerns into a new master plan. Uh, we see that happening in a few communities, but often in not in a very profound way yet. So that's there's an opportunity for more of that. Uh, go on to the next slide, please. And so another sort of unique initiative we have is a regional uh, collaborator, or maybe I call it a sub-regional, a, a part of the MABC region. Uh, what we have is the Metro Mayors Coalition. Now, the Metro Mayors Coalition existed now for, uh, I don't know, 15 or more years, and it's 15 of the core cities and towns uh, at, the, at the center of our region, uh, the most urbanized communities for the most part. Uh, and that group of, it really is the mayors for the most part who actually participate in this. Uh, unlike the typical general regional council, because it's used, might be the to town and city planners and that sort of thing. So this is a different kind of group. It's a little bit more like a cog almost where the actual elected officials are the ones uh, that get involved. Uh, and they have come together and agreed among their sel themselves with, uh, with our facilitation to, to, to have this kind of a, of a platform, a forum for regional collaboration at a, at a higher level uh, within these 15 towns. And then uh, back in 2015, this group took on, put, we put a big climate summit together and the, uh, the mayors and a few towns here signed a, an official kind of agreement that, that they would work together on climate issues and created a climate task force to, to do that, which then has the key uh, officials within each city and town that are the chief sort of climate planners, often the, the planning director or conservation, or in some cases now towns and cities, they're getting sustainability officers and that sort of thing. And so they work together on a number of different specific projects over the years since 2015. See a few examples on the list here. Uh, you know, mitigating heat impacts is a big one in this very urbanized area. Mitigating flood also a big one. Well, so many of these are also coastal communities with the sea level rise issues. Uh, and then deepening the connections between state and federal collaboration. Just a quick example of that. Two of the big pieces of infrastructure that affect Many of these communities are the Charles River Dam and the Amelia Earhart Dam on the Mystic River, the two you know, big rivers coming into the Boston Harbor, uh, and those dams um, both are owned by DCR, state-owned. Uh, and the more recent climate uh, sea level rise modeling done by Woods Hole Group suggests that under certain worst case scenarios in future decades, those, those dams could be overtopped. And if they were over top, the vast areas of Boston, Cambridge, Somerville, uh, Medford, et cetera, would, would be underwater. So uh, they're already looking at ways in which uh, they can plan ahead to uh, make those facilities more resilient uh, and have more capability to handle higher level storms than they might have traditionally been expected to in the past. That's just one example of, we probably couldn't have gotten the state's attention if it was just one or two towns or cities. 
although maybe boss is good, you never know. Uh, but having this 15 group of 15 mayors and towns together uh, is able to, to help, uh, I think, get a little more focus uh, when they're trying to get federal and state agencies involved as well. Uh, so go on to the next slide. Uh, another um, program I wanted to mention um, yes, is uh, our Accelerating Climate Resiliency Grant Program. Uh, and so this is a program where we actually give uh, medium, small to medium, medium sized grants to our member communities and in some cases to other stakeholder groups within communities to actually implement on the ground climate projects. Uh, and it's a program, the, the source of funding for us to be able to give grants is actually through a foundation the grant that we get. Uh, and so we are then the grant manager that we, we accept applications and proposals. Uh, we're in the rare, rare, <laughs> in the rare other side of the table where we're actually the granting agency and people are applying to us. And, and uh, we're, we're, because often I, as we, as I know all of my colleagues, we're, we're often the ones who are applying for grants uh, in different places in which of course we're still doing that too in many places. But in this case, um, we're, we're very fortunate to have the support to be able to do this kind of a program. And it's led to, this is, we're in the third year of this program now. Uh, and you can see some of the priority areas, uh, nature-based solutions, uh, uh, innovative financing, capacity building, um, combining mitigation and adaptation, local food systems. So a number of very diverse different kinds of projects can be funded under this uh, program. And if you go to the next slide, I think there are so, just a few examples, if I remember. Yeah, so just a few examples. The, the Charles River Floating Wetlands uh, is an experimental approach to improving water quality, controlling toxic algal blooms, and improving fish habitat. There was just actually a, a kind of a field trip visit to that recently. Um, projects that strengthen social and, and climate resilience, educating local residents in East Boston. So it's not all just about physical infrastructure projects. It's also about the people side of the equation uh, and getting communities engaged, especially those that are underserved. Uh, and then sustainable landscaping. Is just, these are just three examples of uh, several dozen that this grant program has funded uh, over the last few years. Uh, go ahead, please. The next one, please. And finally, turning to our regional plan, uh, the, the newest regional plan that we've been working on developing called Metro Common 2050. Um, this, is, this will actually be uh, up for, a, we've worked on it for the last three or four years in developing it with a lot of stakeholders, a little bit similar to what KPOD was showing all those stakeholders on this graph. We had a, a similar type of process over a few years. Um, and um, we're on the verge of actually formally taking the plan. It's been fully drafted uh, to our full council for a vote literally next Wednesday. So cross our fingers, our executive committee pre-voted pre on it before the full council and they've already approved this. So we expect it will we'll go through uh, and become our next plan. Uh, just for a little brief context, uh, MAPC did the first regional plan. This is the third of our regional plans in, in that the agency has done in its history. The first one was done in about 1990. It was called uh, Metro Plan. Uh, and then that was updated and replaced in 2008 uh, by a plan that's called Metro Future. And now Metro Future being uh, 13 years old uh, is about to be replaced by Metro Common. And notice that they keep putting Metro in there. So I guess the idea that we're metropolitan planning. So uh, the, the, the same prefix, but a different suffix each time. And um, so the, the structures of each of these plans, as, as you would expect, has evolved quite a bit and become much more uh, stakeholder driven as time has gone by, which you know obviously is a good thing. Uh, on the left, you see the 10 sort of major policy areas that the plan includes and just uh, sort of highlighting three of those where the Metro Common uh, actually has climate related goals and or for all of these there are goals and there are policy recommendations and just quickly highlighting a few of the three uh, areas that have some climate related. This isn't everything in the plan, but it's just a highlighting a few of them uh, that we have here. Uh, so you can get a, a feel for what's coming for the plan that is likely to be adopted uh, next week and will then be our plan probably at least for the next decade. And uh, go on to the next slide. Try 
trying to remember. Yes. Okay. So the other thing I want to just underscore in all the work that MAP do, C does, whether it's this climate planning or whether it's economic development, housing, transportation, land use, open space, you name it, we're working to more fully integrate equity into all of our projects and to really make them be from what they were in the past, a kind of a marginal consideration to really be at the center as much as possible of many of these projects. Um, we developed um, a state of equity report that sort of has a lot of indicators in it of how we're doing as a region on different categories of, of equity. Uh, and that, then there was the second version of that report about four or five years ago. Uh, and then um, we've come up with uh, another program we're working with our towns on to work the, the same to do the same thing at the local level that we're trying to do with the, within the RPA to integrate that within municipal operations called the racial equity municipal municipal action plans or remap for short. You know, looking at questions, and I'm sure all of your regions have looked at these issues in one way or the other. You know, who who has been historically negatively impacted, which populations, and who will be the most impacted by uh, the changes to our climate that we expect to see, and how will the benefits of the strategy, if we have strategies and and mitigation measures, how will the benefits of these be distributed? And so, looking for that to be a core way that um, every that every one of our different policies uh, had, sort of looks at these aspects of things. Uh, go on to the next, please. So uh, to kind of wrap up, there's a few, um, uh, just to say what kinds of legislative and policy activities MAPC has been involved with. Uh, we serve on the state's Global Warming Solutions Act Implementation Advisory Committee, uh, MAPC and five other RPAs, some of whom are in the room here today, uh, serve on new, the newly formed MEPA Advisory Committee for updating the MEPA regulations on environmental justice and, and other and other MEPA regulation changes coming down the road. Uh, and I know, yes, OCPC uh, uh, and Cape Cod are on that, so are Central Mass, Merrimack Valley and Pioneer Valley. Uh, and uh, we were also a founding member of the Water Infrastructure Alliance and, and continue to work on that through the Water, in, uh, I'm sorry, but yeah, through the Water Infrastructure, Infrastructure Alliance, which was an offshoot of the, pro before that, the Legislative Commission on uh, water infrastructure finance, which looked at the, the funding gap and the needs for more funding and in both wastewater, uh, water supply and stormwater. And I think the last slide is the next one, if I remember correctly. Uh, just some of our climate advocacy priorities for the kind of advocacy programs we do, increasing state and federal funding for climate resilience, uh, targeting greenhouse gas emission sources, and always considering land use, the connection between land use and across all the different parties. And that I believe is a wrap for the presentation I have today. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, we have about 10 minutes left and um, I'm gonna do, try to do the 10 minute version of what I have. And maybe we'll, we'll go over maybe five or 10 minutes if anyone has any questions. Um, so, thank you for queuing that up, Sean. Um, so, Old Colony Planning Council, um, we, we are the regional planning uh, agency for Greater Brockton. We have 17 community members in the Brockton Plymouth area and assist them in their planning needs, uh, providing a technical expertise in land use and transportation planning. Um, uh, so, our uh, we have in 2021 updated our previous uh, studies on climate change and transportation. We did one in 2010 and one, one in 2011 uh, through our UPWP. Um, so we wanted to align align our uh, our plans with uh, federal and state response to climate change. Um, we wanted to discern the climate change impact in OCPC region. Um, and what's what's the impact on the on the transportation system, and what have been uh, the the communities in the OCPC region response? What is what is the response been to climate change? And we wanted to uh, develop strategies and projects, specific projects for adaptation and management. Next slide, please. Um, this is the this just shows the impact on. Uh, uh, on carbon emissions that heavy trucks and passenger vehicles has have. Uh, this is across the entire country, not in our region, but it's from the um, 
Bureau of Transportation Statistics, you can see that heavy trucks and passenger vehicles across the country in the last uh, two decades have been uh, the bulk of transportation emissions, carbon emissions, where the other modes of transportation, water, air, rail, pipeline have been much smaller. And I think that was, this is shown in, in some of the other previous uh, presentations. Next, please. Um, so we, the federal directives um, have, in the FHWA come from um, Executive Order 13653 uh, from 2013. And uh, this, uh, this um, executive order directed uh, federal uh, FHWA to engage in partnerships with uh, in all levels of government, state and, and the local level, um, to use risk-informed decision-making and come up with the tools to facilitate it, um, uh, utilize adaptive learning, uh, look at the experiences of uh, the impacts of climate change, what kind of opportunities do we have to uh, adjust to future actions, um, support the state and local governments in, in resiliency. Um, and uh, the FHWA uh, is using, uh, trying to use a data-driven uh, data -driven, uh, decision-making on performance and, uh, and assess the vulnerabilities based on data. Um, look at the loss of roots, uh, look at the loss of situational awareness and service life, uh, especially on, on surface, uh, on road surfaces and uh, inability to shelter in place and evacuate. And of course, there's always the, the safety risk factor. And, um, and another important uh, aspect is the loss of mobility means the loss of uh, economic productivity as, as more facilities are impacted uh, by climate change. Next, sli next slide, please. So the OCPC region, um, uh, not to downplay some of the other impacts of climate change, but um, in, in the OCPC region, there are two basic uh, impacts. We have riverine or inland flooding adjacent to wetlands, rivers, and stream for our inland towns. And, and also for our towns on the coastal region, we have coastal sea level rise and inundation due to flooding. Uh, due to um, weather events, storm events. Actually, both are impacted by, um, by storm events, um, nor'easters and hurricanes. Next, please. Um, the, these are uh, the previous studies that we've, we've done, and uh, they, they focused on some of the things that happened in, in historically in March 2010. There was a storm event that impacted roads throughout at least 15 of our communities. Um, they looked at uh, dams and stormwater and drainage uh, in Plymouth, sea level rise, um, air quality and health, um, sea, uh, repairing and modifying sea, sea walls for our coastal towns um, that looked at dams and um, local storm drainage, detention and retention base, basins. Um, for some of the uh, improvements or, or recommendations, uh, they, uh, they had uh, look, looking at uh, regulation, uh, updating uh, stormwater treatment and retention provisions, uh, floodplain management plans, um, and also to consider low impact development uh, uh, and track elevation for rail. And uh, the 2011 report uh, had uh, extensive stormwater mapping and mapping of impervious areas in, throughout our, our communities. Next, please. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but it, this just shows the MVP uh, uh, program in, in the OCPC region. We have 15 of our 17 uh, communities that, uh, that have participated in the MVP uh, process. Next, please. And uh, I, I just want to touch on just a few of the towns. I'm not going to look, uh, show all of our towns, but just show some of the vulnerabilities and the impacts um, on, on a few of the towns. In Abington, um, the police station is, is located right up, right up against uh, on center, center Street, Central Street. Um, and uh, that's one side of the, uh, of the Island Grove Pond. Um, and, uh, and the other side, it's, uh, it's up against Route 123. 
So in the MVP uh, for Abington, there was a recommendation to uh, make improvements uh, at, at both uh, both ends of, uh, of the pond. Next, please. Um, this this um, is in Bridgewater, and this is from the March 2010 um, storm event. And that, that uh, picture on the left shows what happens to a road when you have too much water going in one place at one time. Uh, it um, undermines the, the base of bituminous concrete uh, roads. And uh, the, the, the photo on the right is the same road as it was repaired. Next, please. In Brockton, uh, the, uh, I took this map from the MVP uh, study that was done for, by a consultant for the, for the city of Brockton. And it shows the vulnerability of the city uh, from the Salisbury Brook, which literally cuts the, uh, the city in two and actually goes right through the downtown. So there are citywide flood issues um, going on in Brockton. And you can see again uh, on the left that shows the uh, impact uh, near Pleasant Street of the Salisbury uh, Brook in March uh, 2010. Next, please. Um, the, um, the MVP uh, report, the full report is available uh, on, the, on the city's website from a consultant. Um, and um, some, I, these are just some of the um, recommendations uh, from that report, um, nature-based solutions and uh, to flood storage. And uh, they, they talk about um, enhancing the, uh, the ability of the natural ability of um, Ellis Brett Pond and uh, other other parcels near Sergeant Way to uh, to improve the um, the capacity uh, during these flood events. For more details, like I said, um, people can go right online. It's it's readily available uh, on the city's website. Next, please. In Duxbury, we have the the other side of the coin. Um, we have sea level rise. Um, they had a consultant uh, do a climate change vulnerability assessment and adaptation plan in 2021. Um, and they, they looked at uh, coastline sea level rise impacts. They, they did some uh, uh, forecasts for 10 year and 50 year horizons. Uh, again, they talk about adaption strategies, uh, uh, like move or retreat existing uh, assets to higher ground, uh, improving, improving flood uh, protection, uh, seawalls, et cetera. Next, please. Kingston, again, sea level rise. Um, they have, uh, their MVP was completed by a consultant. Um, and, and there's also a, uh, in, in partnership with the uh, Jones River Water Watershed Association, the town is currently uh, has a consultant completing um, sea level rise impacts on on the uh, Jones River landing and in the surrounding area. Uh, that includes the some of the roads and some of the uh, uh, the, the bridge over Stony Brook, um, as well as the MBTA. Um, MBTA bridge over landing, landing road. And that, that uh, I believe that study is gonna be done by the end of the year or maybe, maybe next year. Next, please. Uh, th these, uh, this map shows the impact on, on Plymouth, some of the uh, vulnerability, uh, some of the places of vulnerability, uh, Route 3A over the Eel River that bridge was uh, recently, a few years ago, that was reconstructed. However, it still, um, it still is, uh, has potential for flooding, especially with a category two or a category three um, hurricane. I, I believe we only had, Massachusetts only had two category three hurricanes, but even with a category two hurricane, um, Route 3A is a major north-south north uh, route in Plymouth that could cut off uh, people in the south from the north. Um, Taylor Ave was recently reconstructed 
that's another area that's um, inundated uh, during storm events. Next, please. And the last, um, last slide I have uh, just summarizes potential funding opportunities. Um, I have got the Mass Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program. Um, where if towns can, uh, people from uh, local municipalities can, can use some of these um, uh, potential funding sources. Um, towns on the coast, if there, there's 78 communities uh, in, within the coastal zone management, uh, they've got the Coastal Resilience Grant Program um, and other programs, the green communities. I, I think some, uh, we talked about that before in some of the previous um, presentations. Um, and of course, we have our tip and in this federal grants um, at the bottom. And that is the 10 minute version of, of my uh, run through of this presentation. Um, so I did ask uh, participants to use the um, question and answer uh, part of. Uh, a button for questions. So some people put them in the chat. I did have one question here. What was the question? Yeah, Ray, it looks like any questions that were typed in were typed in the chat. Um, there's nothing in the Q&A section. Right, 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 right. I, okay, so I'm going to go back in the chat. Uh, does the Taunton River watershed mapping and resilience model include the southerly portions of Bridgewater, which is tidal? Uh, I'm not sure who, who could answer that. Hey, Ray, I'm back. Yep. I, I, just, I just got back from the EPA thing. I okay, great. Yeah, um, um, we uh, don't, well, we go up to Bridgewater. Um, so we do have mapping around Bridgewater. We do have some of the habitat mapping around Bridgewater. Mm -hmm. um, and we're doing that mostly through uh, Resilient Taunton Watershed Network and the Taunton River uh, Stewardship Council. As far as uh, hard data, we'd be working probably with OCPC on that. And we could, uh, we could definitely do something with you guys. That would be fine to maybe sure. enhance it if Bridgewater has questions. OK. Yeah, this, this is Carlton Hunt from Bridgewater. Yep. I raised the question because our number, and you noted it in this OCPC, noted it, the number one MVP uh, recommendation action was to get a, a, a climate ready model for the southern part of Bridgewater, which is our monitoring station, river monitoring station is at the Tunica Bridge. And the tidal extent extends up along the east side and the confluence of the Taunton River and the, uh, I can never say it, that where the fishery ladder is in Middleborough, that is a zone that even in storms today can really get flooded. But what I'm looking for as part of our master plan and our MVP is what, and there's a, a bridge on Summer Street there that on high water, it really puts the bottom of that bridge. My interest is, can we get some 10 year, 20 year, 50 year projections on where we're going to both the storm and the storm surge uh, data. Can we get some real well, well done modeling that would allow us to think a bit more about that kind of uh, sea level rise? And I, when you were talking, I also saw uh, we need to look at some of our, our a lot of our streets flood uh, because of poor drainage, et cetera. And I think we need to look at the town that way. So uh, I know the town tried to get some kind of grant uh, to do that modeling, but apparently uh, shovel ready projects uh, were more important to the funders. But I, if people have those models done already, I would love to see a presentation on that. And I'm gonna sign off because I've got another meeting to go to. Thank okay. you guys for wonderful presentations. You're welcome. Uh, another question for um, for Bill: Who is in New Bedford? Who is New Bedford working with to complete the resilience plan? From, from Brady Winston. 
Um, I'm not sure who their consultant is. Um, it's, it's an engineering consultant. Um, we just provided some data for them to uh, kind of supplement what they'd be doing and maybe give them some clues as to where they could uh, potentially find some, you know, resilience uh, strategies, actually. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure. Uh, Michelle Paul is actually heading that up in uh, New Bedford. Okay. I'm sure she'd be happy to talk to anybody. Okay, great. Thanks. Yep. Um, I don't see any more questions. Do you see any more questions, Sean? I think that was Mr. Hunt's questions. And I think that's it. Yeah, just, just a question if uh, the slides and presentation would be made available and it will be. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we can make them, we can, we can send them out all together and send them to the uh, different uh, participants. They can put them on, on their websites and we'll, we'll put them on the old colony planning website. So thank you, Ray. And, and to all the participants and the, and the panelists and the attendees and the questions, um, again, this is being recorded. Um, so we'll get both the um, PowerPoint presentations and this recording. Um, it just takes a bit of time to download and everything. So um, if not before the end of this week, the beginning of next. So thank you, Ray, for all your hard work in coordinating this and the um, OCPC transportation team. You're welcome. And, and thank you, Han and, and Stephen, Martin and Bill and all the presenters. Um, excellent presentations, very informative. And um, I learned a lot. I, I appreciate your, your support. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you all. Bye -bye. Thank you for doing this, Ray and Mary. This was great. Was a great You're opportunity welcome. to get together like this. Let's let's keep going. You're welcome. Oh, right? absolutely. <laughs> I love this. Absolutely. <laughs> this is great. Thank you, everybody. Okay.